Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the entire organizing committee of the ISA Con South Zone for the year 2021. It gives me immense pleasure to be a part of the scientific deliberations. In this session, a problem-based learning discussion. In the next 15 minutes, we as anesthesiologist and perioperative physician, how we are going to approach a patient with septic lower limb who's on an anticoagulation and who also has got a difficult airway. Certainly, it does pose a challenge and a concern to the anesthesiologist. And it becomes crucial that you evolve strategies in conjunction with the requirements of the surgical team and try to give the best perioperative care to this patient. I bring to you greetings from Ganga Medical Center and Hospital Coimbatore, a 650 bedded tertiary care referral center for trauma, orthopedics, plastic surgery, microvascular surgery, and burns. And I'm also happy to say this case, which we are going to discuss today, is very common because we have a diabetic food clinic, a dedicated diabetic food clinic, which is extremely busy. And what case scenario we see here is one of the most common scenarios that happens in India because of the fact that India leads the world as the diabetic capital. So we, every third Indian is possibly a pre-diabetic or diabetic and patients above the age of 40 years, the incidence and prevalence of diabetes is extremely high. And it's also unfortunate that many of them are not very well controlled. So they end up with end organ damage, including the neuropathy, the vasculopathy, retinopathy, and nephropathy. So when you deal with a patient coming with a diabetic foot, we created a scenario, a 72-year-old male patient coming with right leg necrotizing fasciitis as a consequence of long-standing diabetic foot, uncontrolled diabetes. It's also a known case of rheumatic heart disease, and he had had a mitral valve replacement, and he's on tablet warfarin, 4 milligram every day. The INR, uh, to make the case simple, is 1.5, so that it gives us an opportunity to discuss the wide spectrum of what we can offer to this patient. And on evaluation, the patient's airway was found to be malampati 4. The mouth opening was about three centimeters and the neck movements were normal. So now when you deal with a patient like this who comes with uh, a septic foot, whom the surgeon wants to operate immediately, before we embark on the journey, it is very, very crucial for us to know what is that we would plan in this patient that would be more site specific, that would result in the least hemodynamic disturbances, and that will not provoke the already compromised both the hemodynamics and the end organ damage. So what is that as an anesthetist I wanted to view? Of course, you will see what would be the was what was the glycosylated hemoglobin and anything more than 10, if it's an uncontrolled diabetic, anything more than 10, you know that the, the immune system is would be grossly uh, deranged and they're more prone for infection, number one. Number two, you will see resting heart rate. And if the heartbeat is high, you know that majority of this patient have got autonomic imbalance and they're prone for orthostatic hypotension. Number three, you would like to see the urine albumin level to see and know and the renal function test. If the renal function is already impaired, we know there is a nephropathy. But if you don't see a normal urea and creatinine, you see, and you don't see an elevated renal parameters, but if the albumin is present in the urine, you know that is the beginning of nephropathy. So it is crucial before you decide on your anesthetic plan, you wanted to categorize and strategize the risk stratification in this patient. And based on that, you will discuss with the surgical team, you will discuss with the patient attenders, explain the risk involved, and then take the patient for a procedure. In this particular case, apart from possible diabetic endorgan issues, 
you also having a mitral valve that has been replaced and the patient is on, has been on anticoagulation. And it's very, very important to find out if the patient has got atrial fibrillation or not. So, and uh, this is a kind of an emergency where you need not or should not wait for normalizing uh, the other parameters. We need to go and then debride it as fast as possible. Fortunately, in our case, the INR is only 1.5. So now we are planning for an immediate surgical debridement. As an anesthetist, what are the options that we have? Number one is general anesthesia. If you're not extremely proficient in a regional technique, or if you do not have the gadgets, like the ultrasound or a peripheral nerve stimulator, when you're confronted with such an approach, it becomes pertinent that you embark on a journey to give a gentle anesthetic to this patient. Is it, uh, is it uh, uh, warranted? The answer should be yes, because uh, every patient, we have to alter our, tailor make our general anesthetic procedure to make it sure that you produce the least hemodynamic disturbances. So you would possibly choose drugs like etomidate, which will pr hardly produce any change in the hemodynamics. And uh, the difficult airway needs have to be addressed too, including the availability of a senior anesthesiologist who's good in airway management, a fibroptic bronchoscope, a video laryngoscope, a pro seal intubating LMA would be the options that you will keep in mind. So it is not impossible to anesthetize such a case under general anesthesia, but you should be sure that you would maintain the hemodynamics. And I would for one, even if it's a small procedure, would like to start an intra-arterial continuous pressure monitoring if I plan for a general anesthetic and also keep ready the phenylephrine or an noradrenaline infusion to make sure that I keep the mean arterial pressure above 70. This would be my strategy if I use general anesthetic. And if I use a centineur axis block, here there is a possibility to use one uh, because the INR is 1.5. And uh, my choice would be to go for a graded epidural. So where you will just block the, the three to four segments that are needed to produce either a debridement or a need, for, for example, a below knee amputation. So you always have to keep in mind the possibility of using a segmental epidural, which produces the least hemodynamic effect. But to give an appropriate segmental epidural, you have to use a stimulating catheter. One of the options which I would like to speak for sake of completion and for the reason that it's available and everyone is good is a spinal. So spinal anesthesia, I would possibly go for a very low spinal, possibly uh, one ml of 0.5% bupivacaine intrathecally without any adjuvant and to make sure that uh, you do not produce any hemodynamic disturbance at the same time, you give a good surgical analgesia and anesthesia. For a 72-year-old, an one ml intrathecal would produce adequate surgical anesthesia for about an hour without producing hemodynamic disturbance. But when you deal a case like this, when you decide to go for a neuraxial, as I said, it's best to monitor intra-arterial continuous pressure monitoring and also keep a vasopressor infusion ready to treat a possible fall in pressures. But if you are good, if you have an ultrasound machine and a stimulator, I would always prefer to go for a site-specific anesthesia and analgesia. And these two pictures broadly describe the cutaneous sensory distribution in, uh, of, for the leg. I'm not going into the details for want of time, but you should know that lower limb regional blocks uh, can be divided into for those above the knee surgical procedure. For example, if the vascularity is compromised and the necrosis is gone uh, quite uh, proximally and the patient and the surgeon decides to go for an above knee amputation, or if the surgeon decides only to go for a debridement or a below knee amputation, broadly you should know the availabilities are for a bony surgical procedure, the nerve blocks needed will be lumbar and sacral plexus. And in the lumbar plexus, you can go for a femoral obturator, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. For the sacral plexus, you will work on sciatic and posticutaneous nerve of the thigh. As far as below the knee, then our requirements go much more distal. Uh, the lumbar plexus uh, predominantly, we the saphenous nerve, which is a branch of the femoral nerve, needs to be blocked, and the sacral plexus. 
especially the terminal branches of the sciatic and the sciatic nerve to be blocked. So this will be our thought process when we decide to go for the block. For hip and upper thigh procedure, you have to think of a lumbar plexus and a sacral plexus block. So with this in mind, we go quickly to see the various blocks that we do. So if you uh, want, then you, you have to be proficient in these blocks if you wanted to anesthetize this patient. One is PNS guided approach, the Vinis, Chayan and Capdevilla. And the ultrasound guided approach, the most commonly used one is the shamrock technique. So these are the equipments that you would need. And if you want a short-term procedure, you can even use lignocaine, but you have the option of using bupivacaine and rupivacaine. For surgical anesthesia, you would prefer to use a 0.5% bupivacaine and 0.75% rupivacaine. For analgesia to continue post-op, you can go to 0.125 bupivacaine and 0.5% and uh, rupivacaine 0.2%. So quickly, uh, if you decide to go for a lumbar plexus block with a peripheral nerve stimulator, it's a lateral positioning. And I am I just wanted to let you know that each one of you should now take it up on how to do a lumbar plexus block with a peripheral nerve stimulator. And when you go for the ultrasound approach, I think this is the, one of the most commonly used technique, that's the shamrock technique. The end point that you see, you keep your uh, the, the curvilinear probe uh, just in between the iliac crest and the lower margin of the ribs, just in the epicenter of that patient in the lateral position. And what, what that you want to see is the vertebral body, the transverse process, usually the quadratus lumborum. And uh, you see the, uh, that's the, um, the psoas muscle. And now you need to place the drug uh, and here you see the lumbar plexus. So we primarily wanted to block this lumbar plexus. And what you actually wanted to see is these three muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, the QL and the psoas, and you need to direct the needle here. Sacral plexus block, uh, just this blocks the, the sciatic and the postcutaneous nerve of the thigh, which supplies the lower limb. It's required when the surgery is performed on the hip and the upper thigh. It's a deeper block. Absolute care must be taken to avoid vascular injury, but in this patient, it is 1.5. So still we can go for a sacral plexus block. So the Mansur parasacral approach is something very simple. And uh, it is very simple because uh, it is based upon the landmark technique. You mark the posterior superior iliac spine. From here, you draw a line to the ischial tuberosity. And from the PSIs, IS, you go down six centimeters this is the point of entry of your needle. Even you can do this with a peripheral nerve stimulator and uh, you look for the presence of uh, the um, contraction of the, the quadriceps muscles. It's a very simple block. The Mansur parasacral approach is very, very simple uh, for, the, um, for the sacral plexus block. So you will actually, um, uh, next we go for the parasacral approach uh, with uh, this is showing the Mansur approach. And this is the Labat approach uh, for the sciatic now. And this is, this is something very simple, uh, USG guided parasacral technique uh, described by you. All that you have to do is use a curvilinear probe and then you just keep, have to keep coming down, scan it down to see the greater sciatic foramen. And uh, you would see the sciatic nerve appearing like this. Um, uh, I have just enumerated it and I would wanted all of you to go through these possible uh, blocks. Um, so these are the various uh, um, techniques that you will approach the sciatic block. And uh, in the PNS guided, uh, you also have to become proficient in subgluteal block, popliteal block, which is very easy to give. So when you deal with uh, any procedure that needs to be done below the knee, it's enough to go for a saphenous block and a popliteal sciatic block. And uh, the popliteal sciatic, you can do it in the popliteal fossa. And when you use an ultrasound, you would like uh, to see the common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve, and you place the drug along this. So if majority of the patients with diabetic foot come with something below the knee, so majority of the time, the block that would help you is a popliteal sciatic nerve block with blocking the saphenous, which is a twig from the lumbar plexus. And this is a part of the sacral plexus. 
So uh, this could be also done with peripheral nerve uh, stimulator. Uh, and uh, you would see for the, uh, uh, the moments of either plantar flexion or dorsiflexion and inject the drug. So in a nutshell, uh, it's important to work up the patient, decide on your capabilities, requirements of the surgeon, available infrastructure, available support. And with all this in mind, you will use a combination of the anesthetic procedures you know. It could be a purely general anesthetic or purely regional anesthetic. Centenure access is a possibility. And you can also use a combination of general anesthesia with regional analgesia if you need. However, the most important thing is you have to make sure that organ perfusions are maintained in the entire perioperative period. And at the end of the procedure, you give a pain free patient. And especially when these patients have got uh, infection present, prone for sepsis, they need to be monitored very closely in the post-operative period by the anesthesiologist to maintain the organ perfusion. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.